Brother, you know we've been going through 1 Corinthians, that first chapter. And the last time we were in 1 Corinthians, we had looked at what Paul had to say about the divisions that were reported among them there in Corinth. And, you know, we remember he appealed to them as brethren, called to be saints in Christ Jesus, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. You remember we, we discussed that verse. And he reminded them that salvation is not of all of Paul and Cephas, it's nor of Apollos. And he said, you were not baptized in our name. And we were not crucified for you. And he asked the question, was, was Paul crucified for you? And then he goes on the air. He says, and, and he asked, is Christ divided? Paul wants them to realize that we shouldn't be either. Right. Okay? So now that's, where, uh, that's where we left that situation. So let's pick it up there where, uh, where we left Paul there. And he was, he's talking now. He makes a transition. He's talking now about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So do you, Paul always, we talked about this earlier, how God, how Paul always, he's maneuvering, okay, in, in his conversations and his dealings with, with brethren and, and whatever, synagogue. He's maneuvering his thinking. So how can I direct his thinking, these people's thinking, how can I direct it on Jesus Christ? See, and there's no other uh, objective that Paul has. I mean, like, let me focus on the Lord and get and, and I can, we can bring a solution to whatever the problem is. So let's pick it up there. He's talking about preaching the gospel in verse 17. He says, preaching of the cross, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be of none effect. Paul refers to two kinds of preaching you can do. You can preach after the manner of men. He calls it wisdom of words. Or you can preach the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the very word of God. Now, you can see right now how relevant this is in our day. Because of this, the, the, the people of God, now, because of this, those who see this, people of God, they have to take a stand then about these kind, two kinds of preaching. One promotes division, okay, and the other promotes unity and the bond of peace. I like the way Paul explains it. How he, how he, in Ephesians 4 1, he starts, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you were called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, that's what he's talking about here. He's living it out. Now, I wanted to, um, I wanted to introduce what we had. This is just to get you back to where we were. And, and so, but uh, I, I wanted to introduce what we had to say by, by this kind of thing this morning. I, I want to remind you, brethren, that we have the true report, okay? We've, been, we've received the true report, the, rick, the written word. It's the work of the Spirit. And holy men, that's, that's what we got. It's not a book. The scriptures here, that's what I'm talking about. It's not a book of magic or something like that. That When we recite the right incantations or we discover the right chance, chance and, and we, and we uh, say the right prayer, things will happen. Mm-hmm. That, that's not what we've received. We've received the true report. This is a, the, now, the Word of God, it does have power, but it's managed and it's directed. Well, we can't make it to glory. This is reminiscent of what Brother Jeremy said this morning. I said, Jer- Brother Jeremy, you're right on target here. We can't make it to glory, not on our own, not by a long shot. There's no way we can make it through this world by ourselves. The situation is so impossible that when Jesus made some comments the disciples heard, he said, who then can be saved? And he, Jesus said, uh, he said, he was right straight up with the disciples. It's an impossible thing for men salvation it's only through god is this kind of thing possible so we need guidance brethren and we need to be directed we need to be kept we do we need to be kept we need we need someone needs to see to this that this is done and this is what god has done in christ jesus he has he has been the sole provider of the salvation of god he is the salvation of god and so now this is this thing is what God has, has designed and he's created. It's so grand and marvelous. It's beyond our abilities. And so he's assigned this task to his own son and he's granted him <clears throat> sovereign power and right to execute right. salvation and get men to glory. And uh, that you can see, you know, you can see right off the bat how wrong it is, you know, to, uh, to be distracted to something else. And, uh, 
and so and and not and also not to give our complete effort in this enterprise of God through his son now uh so the ministry of Jesus in view of this the ministry of Jesus was was uh, effective and what he came to say he said it okay and what he came to do, he did it. I'm saying what God set out to do in Christ Jesus, this work has been established. And it's, it's now functional. And it's now operational. I mean, it's working today. In our day, this is working. The people of God, we can draw near with pure hearts. And we can reign in righteousness. And if you've been to Jesus Christ, you can come to God. And we can... Not only come to God, we can come to Him boldly and we, because we know we've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. That we're no longer unclean, but we've been made clean in Him. Amen. We have access. It's a blessed thing to consider our Lord in this area and these things. In His service to the Father, we're reminded that everything He accomplished, these things, it, it was, His whole manner, His whole conversation in this world was perfect. Jesus didn't have his good days and his bad days. We never see Jesus faltering right. and uncertain and doubting. He wasn't this way. Uh, God was pleased with Jesus throughout the whole period of time he was on the earth. We know this because God spoke out of heaven and said, This is my son and whom I am well pleased. And the, and the holy angels and the uh, heavenly host, they, 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 uh, they responded in hallelujahs and praise to God and amen. And we do too. We say amen, and we marvel in praise of him. We want a glory and praise of Jesus Christ amen. this morning. We want to look at him this morning. We want to see how, how wonderful and lovely he is. He is absolutely the glory and wonder of God. Yeah. You remember the impotent man that lay at the pool of Bethesda when Jesus stopped and talked to him a few moments? He took notice of him. Jesus healed him right then. You remember he was able to get up take up his bed and walk. You remember the woman with the issue of blood? When she touched Jesus, her bleeding stopped. Mm -hmm. The leper's skin, mm -hmm. why, why Jesus healed them, their skin was fresh and clean. Right. He healed them. The man born blind, remember John 10? Born blind, mm -hmm. Jesus would give him his sight. He received his sight. And, he would come, and with, Laz, with Lazarus, remember Lazarus? When Jesus called to him in that domain of, of death, Lazarus came. He came to Jesus. He did respond to Jesus. He walked out of there. When you rehearse the events of Jesus' life like this and concerning his mighty acts and his teachings, then we ask, is there a subject, really, is there a subject that Jesus didn't address in his teachings and his miracles? Is there some, something he left out or missed? No. Jesus didn't come to impress men, though do a bunch of miracles and get everybody on his side, religious leaders and things. He didn't come to try to win over the hearts of men by the things he did and said. Jesus came with a message. Yeah. And, his, and his miracles, give, they, they give testimony to the message, Amen. to what Jesus declares, see. They, they back up what he says, that the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Okay, That was at the pool of Bethesda. That the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. That's what it says. Huh? And that Jesus is Lord over both life and death. Huh? They had to deal with that, those witnesses at Lazarus' tomb. And then one other thing that Jesus declared. For as the Father hath life in himself, so he hath given to Son to have life in himself. And for this reason, I want to back up, and I want to look at the, uh, the account of the woman with the issue of blood. And it's no wonder this is found in both Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's a remarkable thing that happened when you consider it. It's not at all the way, you know, when I read this, this is not at all the way that men would have reported something like this or written it down. Uh, what a tremendous contrast, too, you see, between our, our situation, our human condition, and the Son of, and the son of Man. Uh, the power to heal and to restore and to give life, uh, it resided in Jesus. It, it was in him. And you can see it naturally responds to faith. Uh, in this account, which, which I take it from Luke, uh, Luke 8, and the woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. She had already been to all the experts. 
and she spent all the money, uh, all her living, it said, upon physicians. Neither, neither could be healed of any. She had run out of money, and she was still sick. Now, here's the glory in this account. It's when Jesus passes by. When she heard of Jesus, she came and she pressed in behind. The scripture said she touched him and was made whole. No ifs, ands, or buts. Right there on the spot, she was made whole right then. In her, in her heart, she took hold of Jesus before. And she thought, if I, if I may but just touch the hem of his garment, if I could just get to him, she thought. And that's what she decided to do, brother. And she, and she got to Jesus. She pressed in. She came in and she pressed in behind him and touched him. We did that, didn't we? We've all done that. We've, made that, we've come to that same conclusion ourselves. And we came in and we, we pressed in behind him and, and we, we took hold of him. I'm going to take hold of him, you see. He's coming to town. I'm going to take hold of him. When this lady came into contact with Jesus, she was relieved instantly. Wow, that's, this, that's what I was talking about. This is a remarkable account. She was made whole right then. I hope, brethren, if you have a chance to speak in Babylon or any of its affiliates, that you'll tell them the difference between God's salvation and the efforts of men. Well, remember this incident right here. Now, the, the, I say this because the devil has managed to creep in some places, and, 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 and brethren has been more interested in, in preaching uh, some kind of a recovery thing instead of the rebirth. See, Jesus doesn't preach a, re, a recovery. He, re, he, he, he gives a, a rebirth. God's salvation, we talk about this. God's salvation is not at all about regaining something or recovering anything we once had. Now, as it's lived out here before us, God heals men and he delivers them instantly and immediately by way of a new birth in Christ Jesus. The lady who touched the hem of Jesus' garments, why, she would scoff at our recovery programs today. She would tell you, well, I spent everything I had. I'm not any better. Preachers have had such a hard time declared a new birth. And they've limited themselves in the knowledge of God in this way. <laughs> Even corrupted themselves yeah. just by preaching and working in this kind of environment. Well, I think that uh, what's happened in our day is a, somehow or another the attention's been turned to uh, focus on big turnouts and, uh, and a big attendance. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, then, and we've got to have a big building to hold, hold all these people, the large crowds. But when you consider the salvation of God and when you behold the, the Lord on one hand and then you take a good look at this thing I just talked about, well, we run to Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't hesitate. I, I, it's like when David came up and, and he was so what's going on here? That's when Goliath was shouting at, and they had backed down. Actually, he had backed down the uh, Israeli army. And, uh, but he got angry about this thing. That's right. You know, and, uh, and he, could, he, wanted, he confronted them. That's right. And so I'm going to point this out to you. That's, it's, it's, uh, that's, and, and, you know, he stood up right then against this thing and, and yeah. took action. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we run to Jesus, and we don't leave. We don't leave because he's our good shepherd. That's who he is, and he'll lead you to the high places. He'll lead you to the high places, Jesus will. Amen. Yes, sir. He'll, he'll take you out of the flat lands. He'll take you out of the flat lands and the low places, and he'll take you to the high places. That's where he's going. Praise God. The modern church is not able to do any of these things. They're content for you to stay in the lowlands while we devise, while we work on some kind of re a recovery program or something to that effect. And Jesus said, all that come before me are thieves and robbers and hirelings who care nothing for the sheep. Now, here we have Jesus telling us who they really are. Okay, Jesus needed to tell us who they really are. I mean, they may look like, they may not look like thieves and robbers, but, but Jesus said uh, they are. I mean, they, they got a shepherd's staff, and they, they're wearing the clothes of a shepherd, and they, they act and speak uh, like a shepherd. But Jesus said they're not for real. In other words, he said they're pretending to be shepherds is what they're doing. 
And uh, I wanted to call all of them this morning. I wanted to call all of them con men. I, I, I wanted to do that. And I hope you can receive this, what I'm going to say about this. I know this is this is the hardest thing to say, but they're, uh, they're con men. And uh, the best of these men, these kind of men, they, they've escalated themselves. And you'll, you'll see them on the radio, or you'll, see them on the, you'll hear them on the radio, and you'll see them on TV. And they all have one thing in common. They're not really who they say they are. Okay? They're not. They're con men. And you know a con man, if you knew who they were ahead of time, why, uh, you'd go the other way when they came up. And you sure wouldn't listen to anything they said or do, any, or do anything they said to do. Now, con man, the reason I picked this word, con man comes from, comes from the word confidence. Right. Because that's what they do. They play a confidence game on people. You had to be a good liar. You had to be a good liar to be a con man. And because you had to trick people into placing your confidence and trust in you. This is where the devil has free reign, you see, in this kind of environment, okay, because he's right in the middle of this kind of thing. Lying and deceiving people and all this stuff, this is from Satan. He's all about this. And you know, con men, they work this way. They mix a little bit with that, and, and they, they develop a mixture that they can sell. Now, the, our religious system, for some reason or another, it seems to cater to this kind of thing. I mean, and it promotes and allows for these kind of people. The spirit of Babylon, I'm telling you, could not exist if it wasn't for these people. I'm going to ask you one question. How do men who didn't have anything to begin with, how did they become multimillionaires by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? You have to answer that. I'm going to say right here, that they're con men. And they're playing a confidence game on people. They're saying, believe in me. Believe on our method. Uh, come to my church and these things like this. And they, and they talk so much. And I'll tell you something. They, they dress like the finest shepherds. And they offer the finest enclosures and the places to dwell. But it's strictly of the earth, brethren. It appears to be a work of God. And because this religious system works hard at keeping thousands of families together and it keeps scores of fathers out of the bars and it keeps many, many, many uh, women and, and, and wives faithful to their children, it keeps children off the streets and out of trouble and the world is ready to applaud their great efforts and the modern church, it imagines itself as such a good servant to the needs of the world. But I'm going to tell you, we got to speak out against this kind of deception. We do. This is not bringing the message of God to men. And this is no way, shape, or form the way God intends, intends to bring the message uh, of Christ to us. God may be allowing for this kind of thing to happen, but it's not at all what the kingdom of God brings. You see, because God is not intent for the flesh to boast. And I'm, I'm getting at the text here. This is all about what Paul's saying. Okay, this is all about it. God said, no flesh shall glory in his presence. Isaiah 29, 14, therefore behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of the prudent men shall be hid. Paul makes reference to this verse in our text, verse 19. And it's not that Paul uses this verse to make his point. Actually, this is the point of this verse in Isaiah 29, 14. Paul is saying, this is what this verse is talking about. He sees what God is really referencing by this prophet so many years ago. It, it's as if Paul is saying, I see it now. This is exactly being lived out here before me. This is a time of which the prophet speaks. Paul was, you know, he was raised as an expert in the law. He pro, he preached both to the Jews and the Gentiles, and he was given insight by special revelation. He can see what God is doing now. And in this text, he brings it to light. And you've got to agree with Paul. Flesh will have absolutely nothing to do with God's salvation. God won't have, my salvation will be hid from the worldly wise. 
This is the time when I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the understanding of the prudent. I'll bring it to nothing. Now, Jesus has come back. Uh, Jesus has come from heaven to earth, and he's ascended back to heaven. And Paul says, where are the wise men, the scribes and the disputers? Assemble them and let them explain what God has done. God has turned them into a bunch of babblers. Is what he did. And you say the modern religion has done this thing. They've assembled the very intellectual, the scholars and, their, and the great thinkers and philosophers of the time, and they don't have a clue who Jesus is they, and what he's doing and how Jesus relates to the eternal purpose of God because the religious world, the scriptures say, they require a sign. And the world, they have their wisdom, which must be satisfied. Well, the saints... We understand what God is doing, how he's chosen to operate in all of this. God has confounded this world, you see. He's done it in a way he's brought salvation. A world who seeks after a God, a, a, a God that they fashion after their own thinking and understanding. A, a, they fashion a God that can be f defined by their own wisdom. It, it's confounded them the way God has brought salvation in. Now, we know that the, uh, Paul never wrote a letter to the brethren, like uh, these, these are the theological reflections of Paul, like, like a man would do. These are not, these are not uh, a collection of spiritual thoughts by Paul. What he, what, he, what he called what he had to say was the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I didn't get it from man either. Okay, he made sure you understood that. Paul has a purpose and he has issues to address with his brethren, and he has edification he wants to administer. This is what he says in 2 Corinthians 13, 10. Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness. According to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. So he's, a very, he's a very aware of what he says and how he says it. And I say this because Paul is more than a skillful thinker, which he is. He's more than that. What's going on in his letter actually exceeds Paul's ability. It's far, the, the, the things that Paul revealed are far above uh, what Paul knows uh, and of himself. Paul knows the scriptures. And he can back up what he's saying. But the, but the fact uh, of the, where the power lays and, and what Paul says, he has understanding of, of the, what God is doing. Now, it's found in the word of God, which he preaches. I, 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 this is a contrast between the wisdom of words and the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of the Lord. For God has declared... All of what he's going to, he's already declared what he's going to do ahead of time. Behold, the former things, they are come to pass, and the new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I'll tell you of them. But through the revelation that was given to Paul, he is making known the mystery of God in Christ Jesus. So we want to be sure to preach the gospel of Christ. That's what Paul is preaching, the gospel, in response to the division that crept up in the the congregation there in Corinth, Paul preaches the gospel. In response to the division that continues in our day, we do the same thing. We preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's Paul's intention to show them that all salvation hinges on Jesus Christ. So that salvation is to be found in him. It's exactly now centered on him. Everything that has to do with him. The message is about him. This is, this is in the text now. The message is about him. The nature of the power of those who responded to the message is of Jesus. And the power of God brought by the message that's in the, the power of God that's in the message is about Jesus. They all point to Jesus, these three things. And it's wrong. It's wrong to seek uh, or to be attracted to any other thing. Well, it's, it's just going to be an empty endeavor. It's all it's going to be. Any message does not, does not feature Jesus. What I mean is a, a gospel that's uh, entitled Jesus, but it's not really about him, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, people who do not feature Jesus, you know, uh, those who profess Christ, but their lives are, then, well, they're, they're kind of contradicted. And, and, uh, and a power that's not of God. Now, I'm talking about a, a place or, or a situation 
where uh, uh, where God is professed, but there's absolutely no indication that God is there or working there. That these are the three things, and they're all linked together. Amen. Don't you want to be able to see? I mean, really, don't you want to be able to see that the gospel changes those yeah. who receive it? I mean, yeah. that's what you look for. To see that, we talked about this this morning, we make a judgment in regard to that. To see that the nature of those professing it, that is consistent with the message they've received. Do you want to see that? And we want to see that the power to effectively make this change can only be found in the message, see, from God. Those are the three things that make the gospel of Jesus Christ what it is. It makes it an extremely different message. It makes it a peculiar message. In a, in, a, in a particular message, it stands in contrast to the wisdom of words, a way that Paul refused to preach. Jesus was a preacher. You could say he was the preacher. Back in Nazareth, he stood up in his hometown synagogue after the book of Isaiah was given to him. He found the place where it is written, and he read to them, to them about himself. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because it has anointed me to preach the gospel. Jesus got up. And as he read from the testimony of the scriptures, he delivered a word. And he, Jesus read from the scriptures, and he closed the book, and he handed it back, and he sat down. And then he preached to them nine words. <laughs> this day, this scripture are fulfilled in your ears. Amen. Today you heard the fulfillment of these scriptures. Jesus didn't give them anything to see. You know, he didn't back it up with a miracle or anything like that. It's the scripture he read, by the way. Now, you probably know it. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Amen. All these things were done by the Lord. In this realm, he done them in this realm, and brother, he done them in the, in the realm outside of this, this, this realm. He done it in the seen and the unseen realm, both. Okay. Uh, the significance of these things are actually uh, have, have been done, let's say it this way, um, because he's done it in the unseen realm, we benefit from the significance of this message he preached. Amen. Men could not see them as having been done, the things he'd done in the unseen realm. And it kind of works against the sensitivities of the flesh. They, they can't see this, these things. Jesus declared them and he, he said I've done them and he went back to heaven but we can't see them done and the flesh it, it balks at this kind of thing it doesn't want to hear about a miraculous work we want to see one that's what it says outside of Jesus Christ uh, this, this world all it can do is give a, some kind of a human speculation or they can devise a human philosophy you see what I'm saying we got all kind of these things they're all kind of stuff like that and they're uh, their wisdom of words is what they were. And that's what we're talking about, wisdom of words. Verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be of none effect. If I preach with the wisdom of words instead of preaching Christ Jesus, I make the cross of Christ of none effect. If I preach anything other than Jesus... I will have preached an empty message, a message of none effect. <coughs> it won't do nothing mm -hmm. concerning God's salvation. Yes, amen. God has hid the salvation, his salvation, from the wisdom of this world because they consider it foolishness. That's what the scriptures say. They are perishing because of that. And because they are perishing, they cannot see the wisdom of God. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of the prudent men shall be hid. First Corinthians one twenty one. later on in the chapter, Paul will say, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Amen. That the wisdom of men has blinded them to God. You kind of have to say that men brought it on themselves, you know. Because, you know, all that was needed to recognize a creator was, was the things that God created. I mean, all you need is, uh, is one testimony that of someone who's recognized a creator in creation. Then it's a testimony against all men. 
You see, all you need is one man to be able to recognize God and the things he's done. And then that, that his testimony will, will, will be a, a judgment against all who, those who didn't. Amen. And the scriptures tell us that it's there. You, he has made himself visible in these things. But man professing to be wise became fools. But they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Now, we talked about this. Jesus never did speak to the multitudes like he spoke to his own disciples. We know that everything Jesus told the multitudes, disciples were there to hear it. They were always privy to what Jesus told the multitudes. But, uh, but the multitudes never sat in on what Jesus had to say to the disciples. Okay? And it's not right, you know, is it then, to speak to the multitudes as though they were disciples. That's why Jesus didn't do it. He had things to say to them that was not applicable to the others. And we don't need to do that either, do we? Then yeah, say the Lord didn't do it, and if we should, we sh we should be reluctant to take a stand in this direction either. You know, that means then that the situation we have on our hands, um, like this, this. Mess of division and stuff like this. It works contrary to the things that God is doing. These things really don't, I'm going to say these things don't really belong to God, brother. I'm just going to come right out and tell you what I think about it. I don't think they belong to God. I think it belongs to men. Okay? And we need to be like David when he faced Goliath. You need to get mad about that. You, I, you shouldn't like it. After 50 years, okay, at least 50, I've been scrutinizing you know, looking at this thing, then I'm convinced God's not there, okay? So then it's really not blasphemy then to speak out against it and take a stand against these things and, 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 and the things that they say that's contrary to the gospel that we received. Amen. Yeah. Brother, we received the true report, okay? Yeah. We re we've received a, a witness of these accounts been given to us. And so, brethren, we want to we want to take these this message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we want to we want to hide it within ourselves. And in this in this day, and you know, I just I just been prompted to, to bring this message in this direction. In this day that we're in, we, we want to be able to we want to be able to stand up for the truth and, and stand against those things that, that are not. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen.